Well, good morning, church. Good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. If you agree, go ahead and put your hands together and give God. Amen. Some praise. Our, our men's mime told us he deserves the praise. Amen. He is all powerful, all knowing, all wise, all benevolent. He is long suffering. He deserves every praise he gets. Amen. Well, we're going to continue, First Lady and I, in this teaching series called The Rhythm of Love. And I brought something with me. I wonder if you recognize this. Anybody know what this is? Some of y'all don't know. What is this again? It's a cassette tape brought memory back down memory lane, right? Do you remember what happens? This little precious black ribbon on the inside sometimes get a little twisted. And what do you do? You get a pen or a pencil and you rewind that. Some of y'all looking at me like y'all have no idea what this is. Amen. Am I that old? Hallelujah. This is the cassette tape. And there used to be a cassette player. And if you want to go back a little further, I remember my dad had the Thunderbird, a Ford Thunderbird, and he had an eight track. Come on, somebody. That's real old school. And, um, but when this cassette tape came out, there were many manufacturers who had cassette tapes. Does anybody remember a company called Memorex? Memorex. They had a slogan. Do you remember it at all? They, they had a slogan. They used to ask the question, is it live or is it... Memorex. And so Memorex's claim was that their recording quality was so clean and crisp that if they if the men's chorus were singing and and uh, and you closed your eyes and we popped in the cassette tape from Memorex, Memorex said our recording is so clean, you won't even be able to tell that it's not live. And I don't know how true that was, but um, it is true today for singles. Now, stay with me. If you are single and you're believing that God for a maid and you're in a relationship, one of the things you want to do is become the Memorex company. You want to determine whether or not the person in the relationship that you're in is either live or Memorex. So you don't want to spend the rest of your life with an art of something that's artificial. Say artificial. See, you don't want counterfeit for the rest of your life. You need that which is real. So we're going to spend our time today giving you seven tests to determine whether or not the relationship you want to be in is live or memorized. Stand in honor of God's word. There's a passage of scripture that's going to jump off our time together. Today's message is entitled, Signed, Sealed, Delivered, I'm Yours. But before you say that to someone, you want to make sure that you understand what you're getting. Is this relationship a live relationship or is it just artificial memorex? You see Proverbs chapter 20 verse 6 in the message version. If you see it, say amen. amen. Come on, I want you to read that good and loud this morning so that someone on my microphone could hear you saying it. Uh, read it. On together. One, two, and three. Lots of people claim to be loyal and loving, but where on earth can you find one? And can I have an amen? amen. You may be seated. Everybody claims to be live, but you need to test that thing to make sure that it's not artificial or memorex. So during our time together today, we brought seven tests with you. First lady, when we were going over our notes, she referred to these tests as deal breakers. Now, listen, we get it. Nobody's perfect and no one will score 100 on all of these tests. But you might have a problem if the person that you're, that you're dating can't pass a test. Hey, Amen. <laughs> you might want to reconsider <laughs> whether or not this is a, a match for you or not. So let's jump in with test number one. We call, we call these tests because they're, they're, they're designed to determine whether or not the, the genuineness of this relationship. So seven, um, test number one, real love can always pass. You might want to write these down. You'll need them later. Real love can always pass the love at first sight test. The love at first sight test. Now, the key word here for the love at sight, first sight test is the word objectification. So you're testing to see whether or not this person simply views you as an object, not as a person, but as a means to an end or an object. I want to show you Judges chapter 14, verse 1. We're going to be talking about Samson here in the early going, and you'll see a theme as we go out and spend our time together this morning with, with Brother Samson. Watch this. Judges chapter 14, verse 1. One day, when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women, watch this, caught his eye. 
So you see Samson, the first thing you read about Samson, Samson is that he's watching the ladies, amen. And he saw a Philistine woman and she did what to it? She did what? She caught his eye, that's important, stay with me. When he returned home, he told his mother and his father and his mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye, and look at this, he goes from she caught my eye to, I want to marry her. In Samson's mind, it was love at what? First sight. And then he told his parents, get her for me. This is important. You're single now and you're young now. You're enjoying a benefit that, that wasn't given to in early biblical days. Let me put it to you this way. You didn't get to choose your spouse. Your mom and your daddy got to choose your spouse. What a mess that would have been. Amen. Can you imagine? Here is Horatio, baby. He's your husband. I'm for, for who? Horatio. They will go and find a bride or groom for you and bring them home and you had no choice in the matter. So Samson usurped authority and said, get her for me. His, his mother and his father objected and they said, isn't there even one woman in, in our tribe or among all the Israelites you would marry? He said, they said, must you go to a pagan Philistine and find a wife? But Samson told his father, get her for me. Why? Because she looks good to me. Here's the issue with falling in love, quote, at first sight. Love at first sight kind of ignores the critical element to the development of a healthy relationship. When you fall in love at first sight, it ignores something. It, 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 it ignores the most critical element uh, necessary for a healthy relationship. And what is that critical element? It's called time. Love at first sight is really an urban legend. There is no way you can love someone without really knowing them. So it's really a urban legend. And a better way, I think, to describe this phenomena or this experience is attraction at first sight. Not love. Not love. It is simply an attraction at the point that you see that person for the first time. So what does it look like to, to move to that place of love? Why does it take time? And what does it take time to do? You take time to discover another person's beliefs. It's important that you know what that person believes about everything just about. And it's, enough, it's also important to discover another person's habits because there are good ones, there's bad ones, and you need to know both. Yes. You discover another person's temperament. You discover how they treat their mother. You look at how they treat their father because a lot of times those are, those are primary relationships in that person's life. And it can be indicative of how they will treat you mm. in, your, in your relationship. It is important to discover the idiosyncrasies of another person. Amen. And that just takes time. There's no, other, there's no other way to learn a person and to love a person except by, using, um, by taking advantage of t spending time with them. So what's the question that you would ask yourself? Have you, gonna write this down, this is an important question. Have you had enough time for you to truly get to know this person? Have you had enough time for you to truly get to know this person? I, I was thinking, First Lady, when, um, when you were reading that it takes time to discover um, beliefs and habits and it takes time to discover temperament, it takes time to see how they treat their other loved ones in their lives. I was thinking about people, was, I could hear this, someone saying, that's right, that's why, we, that's why we live together first. Come on, somebody, I thought I heard a mmm. So we can see, so we can take the time necessary. Let me give you a short analogy. There's something called a test drive. Say test drive. test drive. You can test drive a car for eight days. It's still not your car. That's okay. That didn't get over like I thought it was going to get over. But when you call yourselves living together, that's not the real, that's not live. That's not live. It's what? Memorex. There's something about, <laughs> I remember I remember we went to a brother's wedding and it was a little chapel and it was quiet in there. And there's something about being married that's different than about playing married. And I remember, come on, somebody say amen to that. It's two different things. And I remember the, 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 the ring bearer didn't take the ring out the case. And so it was quiet and he says, who has the ring? And then we heard this. All the brothers looked at each other like, man, that is not a good sign. Amen, it sounded like a casket. And then he took the ring out and they went boom and it do jump like that. There's something about the door closing. See, playing married is not the same as being married. 
Because when you are married, there's a finality to it that then you'll really get a chance to see the genuine article. It just takes time. Test number two. Test number two is we're calling it the schoolboy crush test. The schoolboy crush test. And the key word here is immaturity. You're testing for immaturity. Mm. So let's take a look at Judges. We're going to look at Samson's life uh, in Judges chapter 16. It says, sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, please note, this is not the same woman that we read about in Judges 14. So Samson's in love again, (laughs) at least what he calls love. Verse 5, the rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. And at this point, Delilah Culler said, no, I can't do that to Samson. That's my boy, you know, that's my husband, that's my whatever. I can't do that. But just in case she was hesitant or acted like she didn't want to do it, they said, each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. And so what did Delilah say? No, I don't want your money. That's not the right thing to do. No, not what she said. If you'll look with me in verse 6, she says, so Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the strength of your great, tell me the secret of your great strength and how we can be tied up and subdued. Delilah wanted to get paid. She did. She, and see, the schoolboy crush, the schoolboy crush you, you, it, is a problem because when you have a crush on somebody, it causes you to ignore their true character. Mm-hmm. And so you see what it is. So basically you see what you want to see as opposed to what's really there. In a crutch situation, you're wearing those rose-colored glasses, so you don't really see things like they really are. Okay, so we don't want to be too hard on Samson. Delilah was probably a very sensuous woman. Yes. I am sure she was beautiful. And for most men, sensuality for men is uh, a man's kryptonite. We are DC comic um, Marvel. Marvel fans That's in our right. family. So kryptonite, if you know anything about su- Superman, Superman can do anything until kryptonite is introduced into the picture. So Samson's kryptonite was this sensuous woman named Delilah. So because of Delilah and because of this, so this is a schoolboy, schoolgirl crush. He couldn't see Delilah for what she really was. All he saw was this beautiful woman that he was in love with and she could pretty much get anything out of him that she wanted. So it blinds you, that schoolgirl, go- school schoolboy crush blinds you and you can't see the person for what they really are. And it keeps you blind to seeing that you're in a one-sided relationship. Now that, now that's good. What, what we see in the text with Samson and Delilah was, it was clearly a one-sided relationship. Samson was in love, but did you see in your text where it says Delilah loved him too? <laughs> it's not there. Delilah loved cash, and when they told her they were going to pay her, she went right in on Samson. Yeah. And when you got these rose-colored glasses on, and you're, and you, and you're under the schoolboy or schoolgirl crush test, it blinds you to the fact that you're under a one-sided relationship. So let's bring it into 20 and 18. How do you identify... Because Samson clearly didn't get it, didn't check the internet post. But how do you identify uh, whether or not you're in a one-sided relationship? We, there was a long list. We narrowed it down to three indicators. Like Samson, you might be in a one-sided relationship, number one, if you feel a need to apologize for things that you don't, shouldn't be apologizing for. If you're constantly saying, oh, I'm sorry, baby, I'm sorry, forgive me. Oh, did I do that? I'm so sorry. If you're constantly apologizing over and over again for things that you didn't even do wrong, but you're apologizing for, I'm sorry, it's too hot. I'm sorry, it's too cold. You don't have control over the weather. But when you're in a one-sided relationship, but you're afraid that you're because you're constantly apologizing, sign number two, you constantly need to justify his or her behavior to your family and friends. They'll say something, oh, no, don't, don't believe that. He, that's just the way, ignore him. That's just the way he is. Ignore her. She just, you know, her family was a little this, that, and the other, so just ignore that. If you're always having to justify behavior of the person that you're with to your family and friends, you might be, why didn't he call you? Well, he, he doesn't really have to call me back. We don't have that kind of relationship. I'll wait until, you hear, wait until I hear from him. You are probably in a one-sided relationship. Third indicator is this. You constantly feel stressed out about the relationship because you're the only person working hard to keep it going. 
And all the way to keep this relationship going is on you. So then, here's the question you might want to write down to ask yourself as it relates to the schoolboy crush test. Am I seeing only what I want to see? See, when you have a crush on somebody, you have a tendency not to see the warning signs that are blinking right in your face. Test number three. Real love can always pass the fatal attraction test. Now, I got to share with you the key word in this particular um, test is the word stalker. So you're testing to see whether or not this person is actually some level of stalker. Now watch this. This is important. This particular passage of scripture is one of the most relevant, uh, relevant passages of scripture we bumped into in our time together. You know, the Me Too movement is very big and ladies are coming, uh, bringing uh, um, 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 to the forefront what ha the things that were done to them in private by men in power, men of influence. But this is not a new phenomenon. The Bible has always been relevant. And this particular passage of scripture is it's almost as if we plucked it out of a news feed this morning. Let me show it to you. How do you identify a fatal, relaxion, fatal attraction relationship? Well, there are four flaws in the mindset of the person we refer to as the stalker in the fatal, fatal attraction relationship. Here they are. Mindset number one, the stalker, for the stalker, lust is often mistaken for love. I want to show you 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1. In the course of time, Amnon, the son of David, fell in love with um, Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, the son of David. So what you have here in terms of family relationship, Amnon is the half-brother of Tamar. But she's actually Absalom's full sister. Verse 2, Amnon became frustrated to the point of illness on the account of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. Do you see it? The Bible says he was frustrated to the point of illness because she was a virgin. See, that's not, it wasn't that he loved her. He lusted after her virginity. My Lord. And it seemed, here's the text goes on to say, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Now that phrase caught my eye. It said, the Bible says it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. It didn't say it seemed impossible for him to love her or to want to be with her. It said it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. See, he viewed her, he was a, as an object. Notice the unhealthy focus that he had on his stepsister. The second fatal flaw of a stalker is he only listens to advice that will feed its desires. He only listens to advice that feeds its desires. Uh, we'll go down to 2 Samuel verse number 5, chapter 13, verse number 5. And what we find out between verse number 2 and number 5 is that Amnon has a friend named Jonadad. And evidently, he talks to Jonadab about his situation and how he feels about his stepsister. Mm -hmm. And so... Side note, be careful who you call a friend and who you take advice from because the advice that Jonab is getting ready to give to Amnon is not good advice. But this is what Jonab, Jonab, Jonadad said. Go to bed and pretend to be ill. When your father comes to see you, say to him, I would like my sister Tamar to come and give me something to eat. Let her prepare the food in my sight so I may watch her and then eat it from her hand. Jonadab's advice was exactly what Amnon needed to hear. But he wanted So to. that he could go on and do what he wanted to do anyway. Yeah. He talked to his friend about it, but he already knew what he wanted to do. And his wonderful friend just gave him permission to go on and carry out this plot against his sister. You notice what he said. I find it interesting, verse lady. He said, uh, have her to prepare the food in my sight. I want to watch her. So he wanted to watch her. He wanted to sit there and work himself up a little bit while she was preparing the food. I want to watch her. Then I wanted to eat it. I want her to feed it to me out of her hand, which would make her put, him, put her within striking distance. The third bit of um, uh, flatal flaw in the mindset of a stalker, we see that they think lust is, mistake, they mistake lust for love. We also see that they only listen to, the vo to voices that, um, to advice that feed their desires. Thirdly, we see stalkers, for a stalker, violating someone is okay, 
when you love them. So in his mind, he was in love with her, so violating her was not a problem. Let's go to verse 12. Look at her. Look at the emphatic um, disdain and, and, and look, at the, look at the many ways she said, no, don't, my brother, don't. She said to him, don't do what? Don't force me. Such a, such a thing should not be done in Israel. Do not do this. What kind of thing she called it? She said, this is a wicked thing. Then she said, verse 13, what about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? She said, if you do this to me, I will have to wear this, this disgrace in my community for, for a long time. And then she said, well, what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. She said, please speak to the king. He will, uh, will he not keep me from being, he will not forgive me. Keep, he, please speak to the king. I'm mad at, 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 uh, <laughs> at Amnon, I want to choke him out, amen. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. So his sister said, listen, if you really want me that badly, then why don't we just make it official, I'll become your wife, and we can live happily ever after, and you can watch me cook anytime you want to. Look at his response. But he refused to remember. He mistakes lust for love. He listens to bad advice. He thinks violating her is okay because he loves her. He says, verse 14, but he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, the Bible says he raped her. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The fourth fatal flaw is with the stalker, it moves quickly from infatuation to disgust. Let's look at verse number 15. It says, then Amnon, after he had done this thing to her, it says, then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Mm. I mean, that was a quick, I mean, it flipped quickly. And Amnon said to her, get up and get out. <laughs> this story ends badly for everybody involved. Absolutely everybody. In two years, Absalom killed his brother Amnon because he had violated his sister. It does not end well for anybody. These fatal attraction tests are important because they end badly. You have to, it is important to identify a stalker as early in the relationship as, 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 as possible. Yeah. As soon as they get stupid, you get gone. Amen. Get out of the relationship. Yeah. So the question that you ask yourself, is this person interested in you or what they can get from you? Are they interested in you or are they interested in what they can get from you? You know, I was a little surprised at, at, um, at Absalom. It took him two years to kill him. And I probably would have snuffed him that same evening. But um, I pray for pastor, pray, amen. But so he had to wait so that he can get it done and do it correctly. But that was a violation on the highest level. And so um, you said it right. The devastation on that family probably went on for generations behind that. Yeah. Yeah. Test number four. Real love always passes this fourth test. Here's the test. It's the if only for one night test. I say that because we, it's a private, never mind, moving right along. Um, the key word here is boredom. The key word here is boredom. When the, the, if only for one night test is actually, um, you're looking for whether or not the person is just simply bored. I want to show you 2 Samuel. We'll leave, we'll leave Samson alone for a minute. Let's go to David in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. Watch this. The Bible says, verse 1, then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle. I'm sorry, just so we're on the same place, where should kings be in the spring? The, I'm sorry, where? The king should not be at the palace. He's supposed to be leading the armies in battle. Watch this. David sent Joab and his servants with him in all Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Amnon and besieged Rabbah. But David, where was he? He stayed at Jerusalem. So David's boys were so strong, his kingdom was so powerful that he did not have to go. But whether you have to go or not as a leader, it was your position to be in the front of the line. Verse 2. Now David, when evening came, David arose from his bed and was walking around the, the roof of the king's house. Repeat after me. It looks like he's getting bored. Say that. I can barely hear you up here. Maybe it's the fan or maybe it's you. I can't figure it out. But it looks like he's getting bored. 
So now we see the king who should be someplace else at the palace getting bored, walking around from and from the roof. The Bible says he saw a woman doing what? Now, here's normally when we teach this, where I jump all over the Sheba and say, why she got a little self all out in the open like that? Hey, Amen. Don't you know folks live in the neighborhood? <laughs> However, can you tell me where the men were supposed to be? So, so I'm going to give you a bit of a doubt that maybe she was thinking that all the men are gone and it's hot in the house. I'm going to go outside and to get, enjoy the cool night air. I'm just, I'm just saying, I wasn't, I wasn't there. I don't know. Amen. I'm going to tell y'all, don't go to the roof. Amen. Stay in your house. That's just, just a thought. Watch this. And the woman, here, here's the theme again. I got to say this. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. Notice the catch. Samson saw the lady at Timnah, and she was good looking. Samson saw Delilah, and she was good looking. David sees Bathsheba, and she's what? Here we go. See, so I want to give this away real quickly. Men are designed as hunters, and hunters use their vision to see. And so that, that, that means that because you're married doesn't make you blind. Oh, that was quiet when I said that. I, so I won't, turn, I won't say turn to your neighbor and say I'm not blind, because you might be sitting next to your wife, and that probably won't. <laughs> They're probably won't. See, baby, I told you. Pastor said, no, Pastor did not say none of that. That's not what I said. What I'm saying here is you bear a responsibility, gentlemen. The first time you see her, a beautiful woman, you can't help it. You're not blind. Say, Roy, say I ain't blind. All right, he ain't scared. He's sitting right next to his wife. He ain't scared. But, but we're not talking about I see this light. And it's a good looking light. So if I see the light and I go, that's a good looking light. That's different if I go, oh, it's a good looking. Oh, my goodness. Look at that light. My goodness, that's. A light. Come on, somebody. Amen. Y'all look at see, they quiet at 11 o'clock. They're looking at me like all the men looking forward, like, I ain't doing that with you, Pastor. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I'm not doing it with you, Pastor. I'm not. See, here is the deal. Just, just because you're married to a beautiful woman doesn't mean that God's going to stop making other women beautiful as well. So here's a catch 22 that I'm real off script trying to explain to you. Explain it though. I'm gonna explain it. I'm explain it. All right, I'm gonna explain it. See, so I figured it out. See, I'm not blind, but I also am not crazy. <laughs> so, so then uh, one of my brothers taught me this wonderful trick. You just simply, as a man, you see a beautiful woman. You already got a beautiful woman. Amen. Somebody. So you don't just spend that whole oh look at this, look at that. You 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 channel your inner bird. Some of y'all. Come on, y'all. Bird do like this. <laughs> Amen, Bird. Amen. I ain't never noticed the back of my phone looked that sleek. I never. <laughs> That's right. And let the church say amen. amen. That's right. <laughs> because here's the trap. I'm sorry. I'm, we're going to get back to David here. Here's the trap. If you're, if the longer you, the longer you, I won't say it's a trap. I think I said that wrong. Here's the blessing. The longer you focus your gaze on your wife exclusively, the more beautiful she begins to look to you. But when you're out shopping around, looking at every little thing you can look at and on a computer, then it lessens the beauty that you had that God gave you. Amen, somebody. So then you have to take it upon yourself. The king made a decision. He did not channel his inner bird. How do I know that? Verse three. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, we don't know who this one is. <laughs> <laughs> but one somebody said, King, I know, forgive me, Your Highness, royalty, sir, but is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So this one, whoever they were, was sent by God to say, don't do this. But David didn't hear. He sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanliness, so she knew that what had just happened was wrong. And in Israel, she had to, uh, she had to go through a process. I don't know how many days, I believe it was seven to eight days of purification to, before, before she, then she returned to her own house. Verse five, 
Then the woman conceived and she went and told David the three words that you don't ever want to hear if you're a married man cheating on your wife. And they are, especially somebody else's wife, I am pregnant. Not a good word. Not a good word. Maybe I got to tell you something, but I want you to sit down first. <laughs> really? No. I'm not doing that. You, you have to be so very careful not to catch yourself in the a, in a trap of being so enamored by what you see that it turns off every, every sense God gave you. Amen. So what do we take from this is that no matter how routine your routine is, stick to it. Yeah. Because when you go, bad things are going to happen when you go searching for other ways to fill this boredom or other relationships. David had an extra, so don't say that this can't happen to you because David had an extraordinary life. He was the king. People mm -hmm. were at his beck and call. I mean, this boy's life was not boring by any stretch of the imagination, but him not being where he was supposed to be, he found himself bored. Right. So he got bored with his normal life, <laughs> which to us is extraordinary. He also got bored with his harem of wives. It's not like he didn't have wives. How many? It he? wasn't like Delilah was the first woman he's seen in six months. How many? He got over 50 wives at the house. Pause. He can go right downstairs and Pause. pick a wife. How many did she say he had at least 50? 50. I'm sure he had a short one and a tall one and a brown one and a beige one and hey man. He didn't have to do this, but because he was bored, it allowed him to drop his guard. How do you keep guard. up with 50 wives? I'm trying to figure that out. You I'm won't to find keep... out, That's baby. a good answer. Don't worry good about answer. it. Good answer. Praise God. You don't have to you are... worry about that. <laughs> I got my answer. Amen. <laughs> but David became sidetracked by a physical attraction. Now, notice what boredom did for him. It caused, it had two effects. Number one, it diminished his sense of morality. He knew what he was doing was wrong, but it didn't matter because boredom kicked in and he just needed something for only this night. And secondly, um, it, he became... Uh, what do I say, insensitive to the possibility of consequences. Yeah. And then there were negative consequences that spilled out. I mean, now she's pregnant. And somebody, and you, if you know the story, she became pregnant and David had to fix that thing. Her husband was with the other men off at war. Where he's supposed to be. So David brought him home. Anybody know this story? David brought him home and said, hey, y'all send Uriah back. And Uriah came home and said, King, why am I back? We're at war. He said, no, no, brother, I want you to... Th David was constantly pouring wine in Uriah's cup. I want you to spend the night <laughs> at your own house. And uh, you've been such a great soldier to me. I want you to go ahead and spend your night at your house. And he was constantly pouring wine and getting him so he wanted to get him drunk. Because he figured if he got him drunk, then he'd go home and have relations. Well, he went home, but because he felt bad about being able to spend the night at his house and have time with his wife, he slept out. Side. So he returned, and, he, and he, David discovered that he didn't go in to, 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 to have sex with his wife, and so now she's pregnant, and so the story is David wound up killing this man. All because he wasn't where he was supposed to be, and he needed somebody for only one night. So the question we want to write down here is, are they interested in a one-night stand or a lifelong relationship? That's a great question. Is this person interested in a one-night stand or a lifelong relationship? Our fifth question today is, real love can always pass the Houston, we have a problem test. Houston, we have a problem. Our key word here, if you'll take your Bibles to Judges chapter 14. We're going to be in Judges chapter 14. And our key word here is anger management. You're testing for anger management. How do they handle anger? How do they solve problems? Yeah. As we get to verse number 18, Samson um, has um, made a bet with the men of the city. And it turns out they have seven days to solve this riddle. Samson gave them a riddle to solve, and they had seven days to solve it. So in verse number 18, the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, I'm not sure what version you're reading, so I am reading NASB. For, so for the record, I am reading scripture, okay? If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. What he meant by that. And I did not say it this time, y'all. Can't look at me. That. First lady. That's what the first scripture lady. says. Yeah. Judges 14, verse 18, NASB. 
<laughs> when the men of the city couldn't figure out the riddle, they went to Samson's wife and convinced her to go to Samson to find out. Does Samson not have a pattern here? Mm-hmm. But they went, she went to him, found out the answer to the riddle. And so he said, that is how you found out. So Samson felt betrayed by his wife. And Samson, Samson handles his problems one way. Yeah, he doesn't. He has an anger management issue. We'll see. Drop down to verse um, 19. You're in Judges chapter 14. Drop down to verse 19. Um, verse 19. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ascalon and killed 30 of them and took their spoil and gave the changes of clothes to those who told the riddle. Now that's a, that's a mouthful. So we see in the text that, that the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson mightily and then, when, and then he went down and killed 30 Philistines. Now I, need, I feel the need to try to unpack that a little bit for you. You have to know something about it. in the Old Testament, the spirit of God was, did not indwell men like he does in the New Testament. Remember, Jesus says, I want you to go into the upper room and I want you to wait for the spirit of God to come and he's going to indwell you. Acts chapter one, verse eight. But in the Old Testament, the spirit of God did not indwell men. He actually visited upon men or lighted upon men. And so Dave, um, Samson's giftedness was his incredible strength. He had the Nazarene vow, which meant that he didn't ever cut his hair or his beard. And so he had um, incredible strength behind those things. But it only surfaced when the Spirit of God was upon him. And so in this case, now, b- before we give the Spirit of God bad press, I want to un- help you to understand something. God does grant us with the manifestation of his gifts, his power, and his purpose. God grants those to us even today. So, but you cannot blame God for someone who's misusing the manifestation of that gift. You cannot blame the gift itself. You cannot blame the giver of the gifts. You have to take a good look at the person who's given those gifts. Even in church today, sometimes people who are very gifted, say very gifted. They're very gifted, but they misuse their place and their position and their gift. And you cannot blame the gift giver for that. Samson made a choice. God gave me incredible strength and I'm going to use it to settle my own anger issues. His anger burned, the latter part of verse 19 says, and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his friend. Samson's wife betrayed his trust. And his way of dealing with it, with, with it was to kill 30 men to take their clothes and their, and their, and their finances and go give them to, his, to the other men with whom he had made a bet. Obviously, Samson didn't handle his anger or he didn't handle problems well. This is an important point to remember, young singles. I just want you to get this. You need to know what you're working with. If a person is angry at the smallest thing when you're married, it's only gonna, uh, when you're dating, it's only going to magnify when you're married. That's right. People don't become less angry because you put a ring on them. He abandoned his wife, his new wife. They hadn't even consummated the marriage yet. And he ran back to his father's house because his little feelings was hurt. Let's move down. Uh, If you take your Bibles to Judges chapter 15, I think we were in 14. If you'll move down to Judges chapter 15, we want to look at verse number one. It says, but after a while in the time of wheat harvest, Samson visited his wife with a young goat. So please notice it's been a little while. So Samson's had a time, had a chance to cool down at his daddy's house. He went home. So he's cooled down and he's feeling better now. So he's going to go and visit his wife. But, you know, we saw back up in verse 20 where Samson's wife is not his wife anymore. It's been given to his companion. Right. But Samson don't know that yet. And said, I will go in my wife, go into my wife in her room. And again, because the marriage had not been consummated, Samson's showing up to consummate the marriage. But her father did not let her, but the father did not let him enter. Her father said, I really thought that you hated her intensely, so I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please let her be yours instead. Gun Paul's right here. I don't exactly agree with the daddy. If he too crazy for my oldest daughter, he is definitely too crazy for my younger one. So you know what? Samson's really off the plate for any of my daughters, but the father did, (laughs) the father did offer a solution. And that's the point we want to make here is that even when Samson had solutions, he still 
reverted back to anger. Mm. Verse 3, it says, Samson then said to them, this time I shall not be blameless in, God, in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. He said, I'm getting ready to go kill some more Philistines, and it is not my fault this time. <laughs> I guess he felt like last time it was his fault, but this time he was like, nope, I'm mad, so I'm going to go and kill some more Philistines. Wow. He walked past a possible solution and reverted back to his anger. So the question we have to ask, and this is actually a question you ask yourself. Yeah. Are you willing to create a Houston, we have a problem moment so that you can see how this person responds? You want to make this person angry. You intentionally. You want to disagree with this person. Intentionally. You want there to be conflict. Intentionally. So you can see how this person is going to respond. Yep. You can't pretend. I, I love to, we're doing a whole bunch of marriage counseling, a whole bunch. Just got a new couple uh, in the queue, which would be couple number four or five here recently, all 20 somethings. And um, I want to make them fight in counseling. It's my job to see how, 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 how good of a fight I can, I can create because they need to know what they're working with. Please amen. say amen. amen. People have on their brute by Fabri J high karate. I'm telling you how old I am. <laughs> Some brute. people don't have no idea what I'm Not talking brute. about. Old Spice. Old Spice, that's it. That's it. <laughs> um, and they got, you know, they, 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 every hair is in place. Come on, come on, go with me, y'all. You, you don't go see your girl looking like you, you go home and you shower, you shave, you, you know, every hair is in place and she got everything in place. When you marry, folk don't shave for days. Some folk ain't bath this week, amen, I'm just saying. <laughs> How did I get there talking about anger? I don't have no idea. What you see, repeat after me, what you see, what you see. is not always what you get. I don't want to look at me when you say amen. Don't look, don't look at it. Look at me. <laughs> People put on their best behavior. You want to make them angry. I'm not saying do anything heinous, but you want to create a situation to see how they handle anger because it's a big problem if you marry somebody with an anger issue. Amen, church. <laughs> Test number five. We're almost there. Real love has passed. Real love can pass the, you tell me, number one, some of you are writing them down. What's the first test? Love at what? Come on, say it a little louder so I can test number two. What is that? The who? The school? The test number three is what kind of a test? Uh, this is Luther Vandross test number four. And uh, test number five is the, all right, test number six. This is the me and Mrs. Jones at the nine o'clock service. I was tempted to sing it, but first lady, yes. I'm a grown man. I do what I want to do. I sing if I want to. I just don't want to sing it. Amen. So. <laughs> okay. Right? Mm-hmm. Some, some of the other men like, wow, you too, huh? Okay. <laughs> me and Mrs. Jones test, test for exclusivity. Exclusivity. Monogamy will be another word I guess we could use here. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15. Drink water from your own well. Share your love with who? Only, Only whose wife? Lord. Your wife. Why spill the water of your springs in the streets, having sex with just anyone? You should reserve it for yourselves. Never share it with stranger. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, somebody. Hallelujah, glory to God. A fountain. Some of y'all don't get that. A fountain of blessing. Have you ever been to the town square? The fountain just keep on blessing. Amen. It just, waterfall, just keep on blessing. Amen. A fountain of blessing. I, I was talking about earlier, I keep me a cup just in case the fountain, amen. <laughs> you better keep you a cup. I got a little silver cup, but I got the little, they bought me a, um, the one with the, the keep, keep it cold, yeah. I got one of them, I got, all, just, I got one upstairs just in case. Y'all yes, don't get this, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's one on the kitchen counter, Roy. Come on, man. <laughs> oh, my goodness, bro. You have been blessed with a fountain. You ought to drink from the fountain. Amen. The Bible said rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving daughter. I'm going to tell you something. We're about to celebrate 30 years, and because I only, because I only got one fountain. Come on, somebody. Come on now. 
It's, it's one way to stay married, and that is to be married. It's not that complicated. Get you a cup and drink from your own fountain, brother. Amen. Where was I? Verse 19. <laughs> she is a loving deer, a graceful doe. The Bible says, let her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by whose love? Come on, I told you, you can't be looking at everything all over the place and then be captivated by the house. You're going to see something, same thing. If she were to look at you, she's looking at handsome men all day and then she turned at you sitting at the, at the lazy boy eating a bowl of potato chips again. <laughs> <laughs> sitting there scratching and eating. Come on, somebody. I love talking about this. <laughs> How can you tell? You have to be exclusive so that when you're not shopping around, the more you look at your husband, the more you focus on your wife, the more beautiful they become. Come on, church. Amen. amen. It's the true single folk. Don't let, them, don't let anybody tickle you, tra trap you into thinking. Brothers will say, well, yeah, you, you handpicked. Nope. I just got a fountain, bro. What you drinking from? Amen. I'm good. I have a woman who loves me, who cares about me, who, can, who accepts me as is. Yeah, I'm going home, bro. Holler at your boy. Verse 20. I don't play. I go to the house. That's all right. Amen, my brother. Amen. Amen. Come on home, baby. Come on home, Amen. baby. See, that's, see, that's why. Come on to my the cup. house. I, I got a cup. Don't play. <laughs> Verse 20. Why, why be captivated, my focus, son? Focus, Look at this. Focus. Why be captivated, my son? And this is, a, this is important distinction by an immoral woman or, and fondle the breasts of a promiscuous woman. Why, why give yourself? Paul said it this way. When you, he says, whomever you lie down with, you, you become a part of and they become a part of you. Right. He said, if you lie down with a prostitute, then you, although you leave her, you take some of her with you. So why then be captivated by a promiscuous woman? Verse 21, um, for the Lord sees clearly what a man does, examining every path he takes. Don't you love how the word of God deals with everything? Yeah. God ain't scared. He, no, tells us, he talks to us about everything. He it's does. a beautiful thing. So our point that we want to say to the singles is that keep in mind, if he or, was a player before you met him, chances are that he's going to be a player after you marry him. Mm. It very well may not change. And we have to understand God values exclusivity with love. His plan for our lives is one man, one woman, one lifetime. Mm. And, and yes, life happens, stuff happens, and relationships break. However, the original pattern stays the same. God's, God's standard does not change. And so God's design for love is to be exclusive. We talked about that in verse 15 and 17. It says, drink from your own well. Share your love with your own wife. And the passage in Proverbs, verse 15, is strictly talking about sexual intimacy. However. But we want to go a little bit further because your wife not only, your, your spouse not only needs your sexual intimacy, they also deserve your emotional, your spiritual, your relational intimacy well. That's good. As well. You shouldn't be having conversations at the job that you wouldn't have with your husband. There should not be exclusive relationships at the job, at church. Anywhere, there are certain conversations that just belong between you and your spouse. So giving that intimacy. So God's design for love was to be exclusive. It was designed to be abundant. And I think my husband covered that very well. So I won't have any further comments on that. But verse 18, verse 18 speaks to it. And wives, we need to be that fountain at the house. We do. Mm. God, God's design for love is to be satisfying. Verse 19 says it well. Let her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. Yeah. You should do a double take when your spouse walks in. That mm. is the kind of love that we're testing for with this me and Mrs. Jones. Oh, that's good. And finally, God, God's design, love to be safe. Your spouse needs to know that you only have eyes for them. And we now, already talked about that earlier. Now, we're not naive. Um, and even in the body of Christ, people make mistakes. 
Um, marriages are, are interrupted by um, infidelity. We, it, it is what it is. Safe folks have affairs just as, just as often as unsafe folks have affairs. And so now you're left with the question, what do we do next? Intimacy, a betrayal of intimacy leaves a very, very deep wound. But I've seen God bring restoration and I've seen him bring healing. But I've also seen that it was not easy. I know it wasn't easy. Just like a physical wound, a relational wound is going to take uh, time and proper care. So, so what does it look like? We didn't share this earlier, but I want to share it with you. What does it look like? What does this healing look like after somebody did not pass the me and Mrs. Jones test? They actually failed it. Well, it's four levels of, of healing that has to occur. First, you got to be willing to have a thorough examination. That means there has to be a time of inspection. You can't act like it didn't happen. You have to do a, a, a policeman moment, the detective moment, and figure out what exactly did you, he or she do. Then at level two, there has to be an accurate diagnosis. What did they do? Now the next question is, why did they do it? And let's be, I don't want to, don't, don't be upset with me here, but, it, but every relationship, even the one that First Lady and I have together, has, in, has within it imperfections. And so you have to do an honest analysis of your relationship. Why did this, why was this allowed to come into our marriage? What, and I, I know this is tough, but what part did either one of us play in allowing this to happen in this house? The third level, so you examine it, then you diagnose it, and then now you have to have a plan for mending. When someone breaks an arm, the doctor doesn't say, that's nice, let's see what happens. They immobilize that thing. They put a cast on it so that it cannot move. And there's a season in the relationship where the person who cheated has to, has to endure a cast. Come on, somebody. I've seen it too many times where brothers and sisters will say, I'm a grown man. You can't re regulate my time and where I go. Say, well, you've lost that privilege, brother or sister. You forfeited that. So there's a time when you're when when the, the cheater is immobilized. Every every phone call, every email. If they're going to get some bacon, they better show. How, they better come back. What store you going to? How many miles? Did it? I've seen the, the time. You have 30 seconds. Go. I'm, I'm counting. I've seen spouses say, I'm, if I'm going to let you back in, why why do they go through all of this? Because they're trying to reestablish something that was lost. And what's that word? Trust. Trust. Yeah. And if you find your, if you really want to work, make your marriage work again, then you will, you will, you will endure your cast until the day you hear the saw go to cut that thing off. You have to allow your spouse to have every access to every part of your business. Which, which by the way, I'm not sure why there was a season when they didn't have access to every part of your business. There is a there is a phone. I say this every time in the truth. There is a code on my phone and this young lady knows it. There is a list of passwords on my computer and this young lady knows them. That does two things that give her a sense of security to know that she can get in anytime she wants to. And that keeps me in my P's and Q's because she can get in anytime she wants to. <laughs> Stumbled up. They didn't get that, Kevin. That's all right. Then after examination, diagnosis, mending, then there's something that we call, we talked about progressive intimacy. We're talking about progressive healing. So restoration takes time. It has to be a scab that has to grow and underneath the scab, the skin has to reform. Then the scab has to fall off. You with me? Say amen. You know what I'm talking about. And then there's a mark. Come on, say mark. And so it, doesn't, it never goes away completely, but there's a mark, but then you can continue to function again. But it's going to take something called time and care if it's going to break down. I'm sorry for my long explanation. Test, our final test number seven. Well, our question for number six. I'm sorry. Yes, what's the question? Our question that you want to ask is, can I reserve my love for this person and this person alone? So you want to ask yourself that question. Am I prepared? That's good. To, um offer myself to this person and this person alone for a lifetime. That's good. On both, you're talking to both the singles now. Yes. Not only do I expect um, monogamy, am mm -hmm. I prepared to give to it? give it, yes. That's good. Yep. Our final test for the day is the let's get it on test. Let's get it on. Why you look at me when you did it? <laughs> Sorry. Let's get it on test. <laughs> <laughs> and our key, our key word Don't get is, it twisted. We go on. <laughs> It ain't, it ain't a wild party every day, amen. We 50 now, so okay, it's just... Okay, our key word, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. <laughs> the key word for number seven is premarital sex. Mm. Testing for the existence of premarital sex. And when I look at the book of um, Song of Solomon, verse chapter four, 
reading verses 10. Good passage. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than all kinds of spices. Your lips, my bride, my bride, drip honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Hopefully that's a good smell. <laughs> I think that's a good smell. We hope so. A garden locked is my yeah, sister, you, you, my bride. It's going in. A rock garden locked, a spring sealed up. Please notice he is talking to his bride. This is within the confines of marriage. Yes. That this verse is, uh, the context of this verse. God designed sex. I know we think it started in Hollywood and it started on TV, but it didn't. Mm. This was God's idea. Amen. The media and TV have perverted it and made it bad. The world has just kind of sort of turned it into a mess, but it was originally God's design. Yeah. And marriage is the only place sanctioned by God for this level of intimacy. Marriage is that only place. Dr. James Dobson, a um, gentleman um, from Focus on the Family, he has an incredible ministry to families and, ma and married couples. He wrote a book uh, entitled 12 Steps to Bonding. And so um, what Dr. Dobson proposes is that before uh, uh, singles, before there is intimate contact and intercourse, I'm going to use the word, before there's intercourse, intercourse, there should be 11 steps, physical intimacy steps that should occur before you go to, to intercourse. Now in our culture, you look on computer and you sign your name in, you put your profile in, you meet somebody for a date, it's an instant hookup, and then you wonder why there's no real connection. You skipped 11 incredible steps that, that lead to progressive intimacy. Say this with me. There needs to be progressive intimacy. So we all know what intimacy is, right? Progressive intimacy means it needs to go through several levels. I gotta, I gotta go through these because we're, we're, we're near the end of our time. Dr. Dobson says level one is eye to body. Eye to body, what does that mean? You can't help but see the other person. Eye to body is a glance that reveals something. That first time you saw the person that, that you love, you go, wow, she's cute. Well, man, he's handsome. That's eye to body, just an, just an incredible quick glance where you notice them. So step one, you notice them. Number two, then there's eye to eye. This is where you make acquaintance with them. You actually begin to see them and they begin to see you. Step three is voice to voice. Now we're at step number three. They're actually, now we're talking to each other. Say, hey, how are you? My, my name is Dwight. Now I, I was noticing you were working over at the, at the center of the other side of the aisle over there. Is there anything I can do? You know, I, I know some guys over there. He's trying to get in early. Yeah, I know some guys over there can help you with something. So they're having what? Conversation. Say conversation. Notice ain't nobody put any hands on anybody yet. Then there's hand to hand. So finally, step number four, there is, hey, how are you? Good to see you again. Didn't I run into you yesterday? So now there is a hand to hand contact. Step number five is hand to shoulder. Now we're getting to the point where um, there's, it's intimate, but it's non-committal. When you go, how was work yesterday? So now you're at a place where you put your hand on them. Now, I wouldn't recommend this, amen, in our client, in our current environment at work. At work. Don't say, Pastor told me to walk up to you and put, no, he did not. Amen. <laughs> this happens in a, in, a, in a situation where you feel you guys have spent months talking, you know each other, and you got hand to hand, and maybe the hand goes on the shoulder. Number six. Number six, and I can do this because I'm, amen. Number six is where you put the hand on the waist. It's like, ooh, wow. So now, you, now what, what just happened? This is the first step where they're no longer, because this is... Distance. This is distance. This ain't distance. <laughs> right? So now I got, I'm in, right? So now it's romantic. So now we have a relationship. We've, we, we've been hanging out together and I'm maybe walking to her car and this is as far as we go and this is as far as we want to go and that's it. I got my hand on the waist and that's it. Then you get down to um, level seven and this is where most relationships start in our culture. Hugging and kissing. You skip six steps <laughs> face to face and all over each other. And that's not where it starts. That is number seven. Then next, next thing there is, and forgive me, first lady, there is this, this thing where you put your hand on, a, on her head. Now, that's intimate right there. When you get that close and you look at her, watch out, girl. Don't, don't look at me like that. <laughs> right? You see, you see my point? It's like that's kind of intimate. So notice what we said. How, what kind of intimacy is this over the months? 
Progressive, thank you. Yeah. It's progressive intimacy. It's not, what's your name? Let's, let's get it on. Amen. You are not going to have a lasting relationship doing that. Promise me, you're not. But when you get to build up and there's a little tension there and there's a little touch there and there's anticipation there and there's a hand on it, that's, that's building up progressive intimacy. Now we are, Dr. Dawson says, we're at nine to, steps nine to 12 and these are all private and they are all sexual and they are all reserved for what we said in this particular text in Psalms 4, 10 and 12, they are marital. And this is the problem with the culture, young people. Please forgive Pastor Boone for being a little bit biblical and old fashioned at the same time. There is no need for you to ruin your life on a quickness like that. Intimacy is for a lifetime. And if you will give it a life, if you'll go slow, it'll last for a lifetime. But if you rush right into it, you've lost the edge. Watch this. Then there's hand to body, then there's mouth to breast, then there's touching below the waist, and finally there's intercourse. So it takes a while, months have passed, years have passed, and then you've gotten married and then there we are. Sex is not evil. God designed it, it's a beautiful thing, but it, like everything that's worth having, it's worth waiting for. Now, now, now let's be honest, those, those who are preaching this to you did not hit every one of these doors. Amen, somebody. Amen. Let's be honest, church. You, but what I, what, this is what I do know. God, can, God will not hold me accountable for what I didn't know, but he will hold me accountable for what I do know. Just like there's progressive intimacy, there's also something called progressive revelation. So God's going to unpack truths to you as you go along in your walk, single and married. And then when you get those truths, that's when you need to walk in those truths. I hope that makes any sense to you at all. My sister. God created sex as a means of progressive intoxication. It is that slow progression toward being attracted to your spouse and ending in that place of intercourse in marriage. And marriage is that place where a man and his wife can enjoy intimacy at the closest possible level. Yeah. So what do we ask ourselves? What is the question here? Have I allowed my relationship to go too far too fast? Too fast. Has it gone too far too fast? Let's conclude. <clears throat> Let's conclude. We began our time together with the question, is it live or is it Memorex, right? Is this, are, there, are these signs of real love or is this just a cheap copy of love? And so we told you there are seven tests, seven deal-breaking tests. And here they are real quickly. There was a love at first sight test. You take this test to answer the question, what is this relationship really based on? Is it just a quick, fast, I think I love her because I saw her, or is it based on something? Test number two, school, school boy crush test. This is important. You want to find out how mature the person you're about to marry really is. Nobody wants to, no, nobody wants to be married to a baby for 30 years, and so you need to find it out before you exchange rings. Fatal attraction. Is this relationship toxic to me? If I'm uncomfortable, if this person makes me nervous or scared or ang and has anxiety, then I don't care how much they say they love you, you need to get out of that thing. Amen, somebody. Number four, it, it, you gotta take the if it only for one night test. Is this person interested in me or are they just passing time till they see somebody else and then they're gonna dump me when they get a chance to? Test number five, Houston, we have a problem. You want to create scenarios where, met, where anger happens and you see how they handle it. Test number six, the me and Mrs. Jones test. Can, can I be and will this person be the one and only person that I'll spend the rest of my life with? That's exclusivity. And finally, test number seven. Yes, we know we, we save sex for the last one because our culture says it's the first thing you go after. It is the last thing for a lasting relationship you want to go after. But it is essential that you do um, reach this place if you're going to be married, but you do it in marriage. Let's get it on test says, are they willing to wait for authentic intimacy or not? And so you have to decide, ladies and gentlemen, young, young men, young women, whether or not this person is worthy of you. Did I say that? Come on, say it with me. Married persons, they must be worthy of me. Say that. They must be worthy of me. Listen to me carefully. I'm, I'm, I'm a catch. Ask first lady. She'll tell you I'm a catch. I work every day. I love it with all I got. 
I lead my family with integrity. Come on, somebody. I'm a man of God. I'm a catch. And so then I'm not going to give myself to somebody who I have to jump through hoops to be with. That's not that's not love. Saints of God. Amen. So if you're single, I want you to be choosy. I do. I, I beg you, don't just take the first thing that come along because because I would rather have a, a genuine one hundred dollar bill than a counterfeit one hundred dollar bill. It spins and it lasts longer. So here you are. Is this relationship, is this person that I'm currently seeing or hoping to see, is this a live or a Memorex relationship? And don't settle for a cheap copy. Amen, somebody. I want the real thing. Give the Lord some praise in his house. Father, we come before you in the precious name of Christ, and we thank you so very much for yet another opportunity to hear your word. Yeah, First Lady and I were cutting up and, and um, doing what we do, but we, we, we love you, Lord, and we love your word, and we love your people, and we just want to make it as plain and as real as we possibly can, because relationships are the bane of our existence, and there is nothing worse than being in a, in a riding relationship for 30 years. And so to the singles, we pour out our hearts and pour out our prayers and pour out every little bit of knowledge that we have, knowledge that we've acquired, the knowledge that we've gained, uh, that we've gleaned to say one thing, don't be in such a hurry. Make sure you test the, the, test the relationship before you bless the relationship. And anybody worth having won't, won't, won't have a problem with this. But when you find somebody that's pressing you and, and, and egging you on and, and pushing you to, to do things and be things that you're not, then you need to be honest about the fact that that's not a live relationship. It's a cheap copy of a relationship. So we thank you, Lord. We praise you. We magnify you. We lift you up for all the insight and wisdom you've dropped on us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake we say, Amen. We've been talking about relationships for three weeks now. Um, we talked to husbands and wives weeks one and two. We talked to singles this week. And next week, we're going to go ahead and take a, um, a look at divorce um, and divorcees, or we would like to refer to them, those who are single again. We're going to talk to those who are single again, and we're going to help you to identify what a toxic, we touched on it today, but we're going to show you, I think we have five different toxic relationships that, that divorcees need to be careful that they don't enter into. It's a special place to have been married and then, not, and then what, for whatever reason you find yourself not married again. That's a special community. And so you don't want to be a victim of um, the enemy's tricks. We want to show you what toxic relationships look like on next week. But this is the relationship that I'm interested in today. The relationship between you and Christ Jesus. Christ died as a sacrifice for us. Because the relationship with us and God the Father was broken. How was it broken? God set rules and standards, Ten Commandments, the law. And God said, here's the law. And you have to meet every aspect of the law, every jot of the law, every tittle of the law, every, par every part of the law. You have to be perfect in meeting the law. And if you know anything about you like I know about me, I'm not perfect at every rule God has set down ever. It's hard to be because you live in something called flesh. So Jesus said, I am going to become the Lamb of God, the sacrifice for mankind. I am going to do what the Father requires. I'm going to birth myself in a woman, and I'm going to walk on this earth for 30 plus years, and I'm going to be perfect in everything God the Father asks of a man. I'm going to do everything God the Father requires of a man, and then I'm going to allow man to, sacrifice, to crucify me as the lamb slain of God and blood will be shed and God's, God's expectations will be completely met. And on the third day, the Bible says he rose, that will be Easter. He rose up and went back into the right, to heaven where, the, where Hebrew says he's sitting at the right hand side of his father. What does that have to do with you? Jesus, Jesus went through, jumped hoops to make sure that if, you, that if you wanted a relationship with God the Father, you could have one, but it has to come through him. He has been that perfect peace, that sinless man that God required. And because of his work, all we have to do then is to believe in him. 
And when we place our faith in Jesus Christ and the work that he did on Calvary's cross, then and only then are we able to enter into the gates of heaven. The Father will look at us. He won't ask you, how good have you been? How much have you given? How often to church did you come? Did you, did you? He won't ask those questions. He'll ask you one thing. Do you know my son? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? And if you answer in the affirmative, yes, I do. You're in the kingdom of God. But if you say, no, I don't, I, I meant to get around to that. I went to that church that time. They were talking about marriage and stuff. But I had, to, I had to think about it a little bit more. But I never gave my life to Christ. And so then your heart stops beating or the Lord comes back. And so now since you don't have Jesus, the only thing you got to offer God are a bunch of excuses why you are, you're just as good as Jesus was. How then can you stand and say, well, God the Father, I'm, I actually did good and I was good, but you're never going to be perfect. I'm taking my time with this invitation because I believe something. Somebody's here this morning and you know you are not into right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice I didn't say anything about religion so far because this is not about a religion. This is about relationship. Come on, somebody, say the word relationship. See, religion is a bunch of what I can and cannot do. Relationship says, listen, I know you're not going to get it right, but I've already gotten it right for you. Come on, ride on my coattail. Ride on the grace that I've given you. Ride on the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross, and I'll get you in. Amen, somebody. Jesus is asking you this morning to simply stand and say, you know what? I don't understand all there is about the Bible. I don't understand all there is about faith. I don't understand all there is about the shedding of blood. But I do believe this. I believe he loved me enough to die for me. That's all he requires, requires of you today, that you accept the free gift of salvation. Is there one here today? Anyone here today? I invite you, please stand in this place, in this warehouse of a church. God wants to meet you here. Is there one here today? Just one. All you have to do is stand. Well, maybe you're here this morning and you need a church covering and you don't have a church home. And I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that we all need a covering. We need somebody praying for us and somebody serving us and, and also some place where we can pray for others and we can serve others. And Crossroads would love to be that place, that covering for you. We are not the perfect place that's why it's easy for me to tell you, you fit in. We're all pressing through something and Christ is sustaining us all. Are you here today? I'd like to invite you to be a part of what we're doing at this place. Is there one here today? All right then, one last plea. If you are single or you know someone who's single and you know the challenges, my young people, you know the challenges. I know First Lady and I were passing out tests like they were Tic Tacs, and it's not that easy. It's a tough world you live in. It's a tough scenario that you have to press through being a single individual. So I want to pray for those who are single. If you're here today and you know someone in your family, in your life, in your sphere of influence that's single and you want to you want to take them up in prayer today, I want you to stand. If you're here today and you need prayer and you're single, I want you to stand either for yourself or somebody else. Please stand. We want to pray for our singles here today. Whether you or someone in your family, someone at your job, someone in your circle, if you want to pray for them, I'd love to pray with you today. Thank you so much. Come on, raise your right hand. Father, we come before you in the precious name of Christ and we stand in the gap, Lord, for those who are not yet married in this culture. What an incredible challenge they have. Everything on television and everything on our computers, everything on our phone, everything points to love and intimacy and sex. They're bombarded with it. Commercials use it to sell products and TV shows are based on it. And there's every different iteration of sex available in this culture, Lord. And, and our young people are trying to do that which is good and pleasing to you, that which is going to be edifying to their own spirits and bodies. And we need you to stop by and see about them, Lord. 
May your veil of protection be around them as they as they have high standards, as they set high standards and doesn't accept the counterfeit. I pray, Father, that there are relationships that want to be where you would have for them to be, that you'd have them to sit down and have a decent conversation about what the next steps are and how we can be where God wants us to be. And I pray for that person who's been single a very long time and they're giving up hope. And they're not sure what, what's next for them. I pray, Father, that you stop by and give them insight as to what you have for them. And if it's your will that they find a mate, then I pray, Father, that you, that you bring them the perfect person for them. Not a perfect person, but the person who's perfect for them. Right now, Lord, we ask that you would cover our singles in the body of Christ. They have a tough situation ahead of them, Lord, trying to live day to day. But we know you're going to keep them and protect them. And right now, Father, they're releasing the fears and doubts and concerns. They're going to just trust you. They're going to live their lives every day and stay close to you. And I pray this. If there are wolves in sheep's clothing and counterfeits that are circling in on them, won't you, Father, do something about it and move them out of the way? We thank you, Lord, and we praise you and we magnify you for who you are and all you're doing. It's in Jesus' name we pray and for his sake we say, amen. Give the Lord some praise on your way back to your seat. Thank you.